Iron Culture, that's not the way we typically start these with me just saying the name of the podcast. Normally, someone says Eric, and then I say Omar, or I will say Trexler, and then they will say Helms. But today, the only thing I'm going to say is Lane. Norton. Hey, that's who we got on the podcast today, folks. So this is, uh, I'm rolling solo, but I am not alone by any means. I'm here joined with someone who's actually known me, at least in an online capacity, for, geez, 15 years? Does that sound right, Lane? That is probably actually a little bit shy. Probably like yeah. 16 or 17. We worked together in 2007. So, yeah, uh, probably about 17 years. I don't know how long you you were you and I interacted on the forums before we started working together, but I imagine yeah. it was probably a while. So... Yeah, let's let's. I'm going to go through the history. So, it, we we technically we we worked together properly in '09, but in '07, you had a first time competitor message you after he did the silver and black, uh, and saying, "Hey, I messed up my peak. I don't know what to do right, but I followed your article. Can you help me for the next weekend where I'm doing the Contra Costa?" And you were like, "Sure, kid." And uh, and by kid, I mean we're only d different by one year in age, but you were a more experienced person in the space and you hooked a boy up with his peak week protocol for the next week. Um, cause I just wanted to look right on stage and have some good photos and, uh, in my first season and you did that. And then in 09, I actually hired you as, as my coach through that big season. But prior to that, I want to say as early as 2005, I was probably asking questions as Quelly of straight flex. So yeah, we're, it's actually probably more like 18 years. Yeah, I mean, it's always funny because whenever I do, I don't know, some, some, usually it's like if I do a milestone post, like when I passed uh, 900,000 followers on Instagram, I put up a post. And there was actually probably like a, I don't know, a half dozen people who were like, straight flexed, OG, you know? And I'm like, all right, them some OGs right there. Cause I think I stopped posting on the forums, at least with any consistency around like 2010, 2011. Um, so I'm like, man, there's, there's some people who have been following a while. And every once in a while, I get somebody who's like, yeah, I remember you on teambodybuilding.com back in like 2002, 2003. I'm like, wow, that is an OG OG. So yeah, it's a very, you know, when people ask me to kind of explain the the, the etiology of everything, I'm like, it, it was a complete accident how I wound up here I am, how I am today. You know, um, and I'm sure in some way, like, I don't want to say a complete accident, but you know, there was no grand vision or anything like that. It was mm. just kind of, I was doing stuff I loved doing and thought about how could I make an income out of this and was fortunate enough to kind of, you know, land on the right spot. Yeah, man. And I think your process of it not being a complete accident um, allowed it to be even less of a complete accident for each subsequent generation. So yeah. I remember sitting down uh, in my living room uh, with Jeff Alberts, Brad Loomis, and Alberto Nunez, uh, Father Flex from the, the forums, who actually was who actually was around in the teen bodybuilding days, even a couple of years prior to me jumping on. Um, and we're going, hey, like we think that there is a real lack of good information here in California. That's the mindset we have at this point. I didn't think it online that degree. Um, you know, myself and, and, and Berto, we have these vlogs that are, are no, not vlogs, blogs on the, uh, the contest prep, like mini portion of the forums that a lot of people are following, you know, Brad, you know how to, you've got a gym, you know, we're thinking brick and mortar still, Jeff, you've got the experience, uh, Berto, you're already coaching people. We should, we should do something here. Um, and you know, we figured, okay, well, how do we actually subsidize and pay for going to these shows, interviewing athletes and putting out informational YouTube videos and blogs and all that. And we were like, well, I know that there's people who actually like do online coaching. We should look into it. And it was Lane Norton, Joe Klimczewski. That was it. And we were looking into uh, like, okay, well, what do they charge? Like, I don't know. Like they have websites, I think. So it was, it was a simpler time by, by, by many ways of looking at it, at least from our perspective. But um, yeah, but be, because you were doing what you were doing, I kind of had a career archetype, um, and I'm forever grateful for that. The interesting thing, and I think the, the, the cool conversation to have today, is I know 
maybe we don't even agree necessarily, but I think it's an interesting discussion to have, is in the modern era now, 18 years later, where getting out good scientific-based information is not necessarily the problem anymore. It's helping people deal with the fire hose that is pointed at their face where they're overwhelmed with so much and they're getting good and bad information at a mile per minute. Um, how do we actually safeguard against, you know, really poor information from being out there? Or I think the angle I've taken a little more is help people discern the good from the bad and try to create some type of schema to understand it all. So you've probably been one of the most successful science communicators in the space of nutrition, health, resistance training, and bodybuilding. Um, none of us are successful as Jeff Nippert because, you know, he's a unicorn. But um, you have been on, on some very notable podcasts. Um, you continue to do so, and you've garnered a very large social media following. Um, let me ask you if you have an overall philosophy of how to improve the science literacy of your audience. Or is it more of uh, semi-accidental, like you mentioned, that, you know, how your career started this? What's, where do you see all this? So a lot of, we have a lot of really great points. The first one being, a lot of people ask me all the time, man, and this information, it, it must, it's so much worse now than it was 20 years ago. And what I'll tell people is, you, I actually think if you know how to look, and I'll, I'll go through like how I tell people how to look. If you know how to look for good info, it's way better now than it was 20 years ago. Because 20 years ago, there pretty much was no good info. It was like shinfo, you know, like just shit info. It's 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 what some dude in a gym would told his bro, and then they post on on the bodybuilding forums. And hey, you can cite some studies, but if you're not as jacked as the other guy, they're gonna go, Wow, well, I, I don't believe you, you know. And um, you know. Interestingly, I'm going to kind of, I'll dovetail this back in, but one of the reasons I was, I mean, it's probably a trauma response to just be honest with you, but one of the reasons I was so like motivated to do my PhD and compete in bodybuilding and compete in powerlifting was I'm like, and then coaching do well. I'm like, I'm just not going to give anybody any reason that they're going to be able to like step to me. Now, of course people still do, you know, but it's, it's funny. I think I, Whenever somebody invokes anecdote, I'll kind of very rarely will I not be able to say, but my anecdote is better. So if you want to invoke, and I'll say, hey, like, I'm not a fan of anecdote, but if you want to invoke it, mine's better. So like, you know, but I think if you know where to look, there's a lot of really good information now. And what I tell people, if I had to kind of condense it into five minutes, of how to know if somebody's really an expert or not is the first thing is real experts don't usually talk in absolutes. It is very rare that you're going to have somebody who's, I'm thinking about guys like you, Mike Israel, Alan Aragon, you know, Breck and you know, this kind of like the evidence, if we like put together kind of, you know, Eric Trexler, Greg Douglas, we put together like the evidence based sort of crew. It's just really rare that you'll hear somebody say something like best, worst, always, never. It, it's just because we understand that there is a lot of shades of gray to all this stuff. And I think one of the things that's really important about you and I having a coaching background, in addition to applying it to ourselves and an academic background, is we also understand that the theoretical best, a lot of times, just does not pan out in practice. because. Human beings aren't robots. I mean, I remember, you know, 20 years ago thinking, well, I can solve the obesity crisis, eat these macros, you know? And it's kind of like, well, physiology is one thing, but I've actually in the last, I would say, six, seven years become way more interested in what happens up here, you know? Um, because as unsexy as it is, mindset, behavior change, uh, you know, kind of like cornerstones of cognitive therapy in some ways. Um, they're what really gets things done. Telling somebody information doesn't really get things done. I, like I'll use a financial example, right? Um, and, and Dave Ramsey will say this all the time. He'll say, in order to save money, what do you got to do? You got to earn more than you spend. But, okay, so go do that. 
like the information is not that helpful because yeah. as as robotic as we want to make this stuff, all this stuff gets tied up in people's lifestyle, habits, behaviors. And so actually it's funny. I just did a, a story where the I said in text, for anything to change, you have to change. And that applies to your finances. It applies to your body. It applies to your relationships. And I think that stuff starts up here, you know? And so I think having that practical hands-on application of coaching, man, that was so important. Like people ask me all the time, do you think your PhD was necessary for you to do what you do? No, I don't think it's necessary. I do think it was really helpful for a few different reasons on a personal level. It taught me a lot of resilience because, I mean, and I'm sure you've experienced this, a PhD is one of the hardest things you'll ever do in your life. It is, it is just, you are adrift at sea and there is no life raft, right? Like either you swim or you sink, that is it. And, you know, having a good mentor, which I did, um, and good lab mates, that helps. But at the end of the day, if you don't produce... You could be 10 years and you don't have your PhD. There's no, it's not like med school. You pass these tests and here you go. Like, and I'm no knock on med school. It's just a PhD is, um, it's kind of a different level of resolve to, to get it done because there is that unknown of, I mean, you can run these experiments and if they don't work, you know, like, and I'm not even talking the null hypothesis. I'm talking about just having trouble with data collection or dropouts or, you know, I can get the measurement for protein synthesis to work for two years. Mm. And it took like months and months and months of like just m- analyzing each individual step to really get it. But <clears throat> taught me a lot of problem solving, taught me resilience. And it just kind of, it also taught me kind of the behind the scenes of research, which I do feel like is really important. And I, I will say, if you want to do a really great job of communicating research to people, it is hard to do so without having done it yourself. And uh, I'll give an example of that. I I remember um, one of Mike Zordos' students years ago did a study where he was doing um, a circuit, right, as one of the treatments. And the circuit was in a very particular order. And I knew why it was in a particular order. But people will read studies like that and say, oh, I've got to do it in that order. There's something special about that order. I said, Chad, why'd you do it in that order? He said, because we were in a 10 by 12 room. It was the only way we could get two people training at the same time. Mm-hmm. And it's like, so if you don't know that kind of background or you know, just even the different techniques, and I'll, I'll give an example um, that was recent. There was a study done where they were looking at energy expenditure. Um, it, was a, it was a meta-analysis, actually. And... They showed that low carb diets had this way bigger energy expenditure. Um, but when you look through the way they segmented it out, they're, they segmented into short and long term. And in the short term, there was, there was actually favoritism towards higher carb diets. In the long term, there was favoritism, like strong favoritism towards low carb diets on energy expenditure. But one of the, way, one of the things I'll always tell people is, are they directly measuring what you care about? Because if they're not, you're making a lot of assumptions, right? So, you know, it turns out they're using a technique called, for the long-term experiments, they're using a technique called doubly labeled water. The shorter term, were metabolic chamber. And when they had both sets of, now the metabolic chamber is the direct measurement. The, in the shorter term, they would use metabolic chamber. In the longer term, when they had both available, metabolic chamber or... Um, or uh, water. water, they chose doubly labeled water. Now, I'm not saying that this was purposeful or anything like that. You know, I, what I always tell people, you have to look at the inclusion criteria. It's very important. Um, but they found that, you know, longer term, they saw this difference. And their conclusion was, well, there must be some kind of like metabolic switch that occurs that, you know, causes this to happen. And so I actually went through like each of the individual studies and I'm like, okay, if we're really seeing this big difference in, in energy expenditure, if they measured body weight or body fat, we should see difference in that. And there was not a single study where they actually saw a difference. And so to me, I'm like, okay, what is more important? Is it the actual loss of body fat and body weight? Or is it this surrogate measurement of another surrogate measurement, energy expenditure? Um, is that it? 
And I can remember uh, another great science communicator, Neil deGrasse Tyson, being on Joe Rogan's podcast. And Joe Rogan was talking about UFOs. And I think he was showing a bit like that or recalling an account. I'm going to paraphrase. So I'm probably going to butcher it. Recalling an account from a pilot who saw an object drop like 20,000 feet in a ridiculous amount of time. And there's no way any Earth mount. And Neil deGrasse Tyson said, so did he actually see it or did his instrument register that? Mm. He said, well, it was his instrument. He said, okay, well, why do you have trust that that just wasn't a malfunction? And I think like you and I know from doing various different data collections, I have run so many things in triplicate, meaning I take the same sample, I put it in three times, do the exact same thing to it. And people might be surprised at some of the spreads you get. Now, it's usually not a big spread, but it's not like, you know, super tight. So I think like being able to get into that nitty gritty of research breakdowns, I do think having done it is important. Uh You might be able to get there if you just read enough and read enough about how the individual techniques work, but man, it would be really, really tough. Um, But when it comes to people in academia, I think the problem is most of them will provide a lot of nuance. You know, every once in a while, this is the hard part for people is they'll go, well, this person's a physician or this person is a cardiologist or this person is a PhD or this person is a PhD in this field. And what I'll always tell people is a degree certification. The only thing that will do for me when I'm listening to somebody make claims is I might give them a little bit more leeway, especially if it's in their area of study. Um, But at the end of the day, I'm going to look at the claim and then look at the actual research data and make my own opinion because I have just seen too many times where people with even really impressive qualifications have said things that are just plain false. And uh, all you need to do is go down the list of Nobel Prize winners. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this kind of like this uh, phenomenon, but if you go on the list of uh, Nobel Prize winners, I think it's something like almost a third to half um, ended up believing in some kind of non-evidence-based quackery by the end of their careers. I mean, um, you know, healing crystals, uh, eugenics, like all kinds of crazy stuff. And, um, you know, I think what that says is you can be a really smart person and still believe in absolute bullshit. And I think people... Again, I was, I have my own biases, absolutely. And there have been times when I have, you know, I wouldn't say I've made strong claims, but I've made recommendations that I later kind of was like, okay, well, that was, you know, that didn't pan out, you know, branch shooting acids, that sort of thing. But I'll tell people, I don't usually plant my flag real strong on stuff I'm not pretty sure about. If you see me plant my flag really strong, you probably should pay attention because I don't usually do it. Yeah. And, you know, I, I just, it's, it's so hard for people to get past that barrier of like, well, what's the one thing to look for? And it's, it's not degrees. It's not credentials. It's not scientific publications. It's really, how do they talk? Um, if you ask a real expert a question, a lot of times you'll get a question right back or a couple of questions, right? If I went to a really smart financial advisor and I said, hey, what's the best investment? They're going to ask me all kinds of questions about, well, hey, you know, when are you looking to retire? What's your risk tolerance? What are your goals in the short to moderate and long term? Uh, how much can you put in per month? Like, you know, they're going to ask me a lot of questions to try and like figure this stuff out. Same way if somebody says, what's the best training split? Uh-huh. Well, how many, how much time can you dedicate to training? What is your goal? Um, what do you enjoy doing? You know, like, there's going to be a lot of different things that I'm going to ask back to try and determine what's going to be best for them as an individual. And so I think it is, it is uh, Alan Levinovitz said this. He's a religious studies scholar. Um, and he said something that I thought was, was pretty poignant. It's hard for people to identify real experts because a real expert actually sounds unsure a lot of times. Uh-huh. They sound yeah. as they're not making these strong claims. And I think, quite frankly, people, they, they like... One, I think a lot of people want to believe in bullshit because it's more attractive than the stuff that actually works, which is, it just, 
99.9% of the time is the boring stuff that we all just keep harping on. Two, people, you know, just look at elections. The person with the best policy or the smartest person or the person with the best track record doesn't usually win. It's basically a glorified popularity contest. Who has better sound bites? Who makes who who has better mic drop moments? You know, like a lot of these, if you look like if they fact check some of these political speeches, you'd be like, man, like this person, like most people think this person won, and they actually had more fallacies in their claims than this other person, you know? And that gets to a point that I heard Greg Knuckles make one time, which was people are pretty good if you are one-on-one at determining, if they're talking to somebody, at determining, does this person have more knowledge on this subject than I do? But what they're really bad at is if two people are arguing who have more knowledge than them, we are horrible at figuring out of the two yeah. which, which one has more knowledge. So I think all those things play in. And I, I would just tell people, you know, look for people who don't make strong statements and, and they, they provide a lot of context, nuance, uh, like even me, a lot of, like a great example, a lot of people will say, well, Lane's anti-low car. And I'm like, mm, look at what I say. When I, when I come across as anti-low car, it's actually just me usually explaining why a statement made by somebody who's very pro low card is incorrect. But I'll always, well, I'll, tr- I'll usually try to juxtapose that with, hey, if you like low carb, then it's a completely viable way to lose weight. It's certainly not worse than any other methodology for most things. Um, but here's the things to consider, you know, and the same thing with uh, intermittent fasting, like, um, you know, I know we've had some uh, studies out of Grant Tinsley's lab, but I'll tell people, if you inject me with true serum and say, hey, do you, if I want to build the most muscle possible, do I think intermittent fasting is the best thing you can possibly do? I'm going to say, no, I, I don't think it is, but I'll, I have over time walked it back to say, but at least in the short term, we don't really see big differences. We don't see differences in lean mass if you're, you know, doing the traditional 16-8 and you're training during that feeding window and you're getting three, you know, protein feedings a day. So again, you know, the difference between myself and you or somebody who is not an expert, somebody who's not an expert might just say, see, intermittent fasting is just as good for muscle building. Or they might say, hey, intermittent fasting is garbage. You can't build muscle on it. Whereas you and I will go, hey, look, here's this study. Here's what it showed. Now, here's my opinion. And here, I'll tell you what I do. Okay. You will, and a lot of times when I want to give a um an opinion i'll say this is what i do right but that's very different than you know a gary Bre- gary brecca getting up in front of a, a white pop board and saying you liquefy lean muscle in three minutes <laughs> yeah yeah it, it it's tough to compete sometimes with the the presentation theatrics that someone who is not trying to be evidence-based can do and is allowed to get away with um, and can leverage. And I think that is what often we're up against that is not quite the same as it was back in the day. And back in the day, you would see a lot of quote unquote evidence based um, personalities. You know, like some of the people you mentioned kind of come from the original era. They didn't really think about quote unquote marketing or uh, headlines or anything like that. They just kind of had a, they're basically cult of personalities, you know, many of the people who, I think, you know, you, you started that way as well, but then you became a little more savvy where you get by on, you know, accolades that kind of counteract what the, the bro scientist is saying, cause shit, you're also big or shit, you're also strong and all that type of thing, which gets you in the door for the bros, especially in the bodybuilding community. And then you are able to talk a good game. Um, and you know, you're, you're potentially have a likable or at least interesting personality and you get there. But I noticed something is that from the, the kind of the mid 2000s era, um, where it was just, I need to put out good information because there is just literally bad information out there and it's hard to find good information, that that's, that's how it was done. And now moving into the more modern era, there's have to, we, we've had to learn a lot of the same strategies that just general information peddlers or charlatans or, or just anyone in marketing would use to be successful. 
and um, doing things like agonizing over what does the thumbnail and the title look like on a video is something that any successful YouTuber will do now. If you've seen someone grow to a six-figure number of followers over a period of one year or less, I can almost guarantee you that they've spent time figuring out what's the way that I can do that to get the algorithm to work for me. And then the difference between them and someone who's peddling bullshit is just the content. And it's delivering on, on that kind of slightly clickbaity title. Um, and I remember there being a period in the mid 2000s into the 2010s, 20 aughts kind of period where a lot of the newer age science communicators, um, so for example, Greg Knuckles, um, were n the, I, the opinion of their approach was looked down on by some of the folks who were who came before them because it was like, listen, all you do is you just go out there and you say the right thing and then that's good. Um, but I think it's been a little more embraced now as we've understood, because I would fully agree. Um, 15, 20 years ago, the issue was a lack of good information and uh, entrenched poor information or outdated information, quote unquote, bro science. And now it's it's not that. It, it is truly an issue of there being a ton of information and people being unable to discern, like you said, between two people arguing and the difference between tr true experts and non-experts. And we've had huge discussions about this at the societal level, the death of expertise, for example, or, you know, just the rise of conspiracy theories and pseudoscience and disinformation and misinformation. And it has nothing to do with the lack of the information actually being out there. It's these things taking hold and there's these competing theories and competing camps and it becomes politicized. Um, so especially in the US. And I think that is a very different problem to solve than we had in, in the past. So now it's this question of what tools can we use? And sometimes running up against this issue where the tool that we want to use is the tool that's creating the problem. You know, manipulating the psychology of the masses is the reason why there are these things that we're trying to correct. And another issue, and you brought this up, is that the, the language of the true expert is one that's going to include nuance and we'll never speak in absolutes, except when we're saying we'll never speak in absolutes. But the, uh, the, the thing is that you were talking about the value of being involved in a PhD and doing research and, uh, and, and, and I a hundred percent agree and not, not even necessarily a PhD. You could do a master's if it involves research, just getting behind the scenes. One other thing that is just hammered into you and bred into you as a PhD student, especially, and certainly during your master's, is not speaking in absolutes, being extremely cautious, using the right kind of language. We're taught to disconfirm hypotheses and state the limitations. And we are, I would say to some degree, we're taught to be deathly afraid of getting something slightly wrong. So, and, and, I've noticed this, this is interesting, that when you hang out in pure academic communities, they have a bit of a love-hate relationship, even with the good guys in the like science communication space. It's gotten a little bit better. Um, but when you, when, when you hang out and, and you kind of get to the real nitty gritty of, of conversation, people open up, you're at the conference afterwards and people are drinking a little bit, you can get your very, very high profile, successful academic who doesn't really understand or have the time for social media. Maybe they've got, they've got a Twitter, but they're not really out there. And they see someone who might walk in both worlds, who has done some research, some academia, but they're out there on the internet being unprofessional. And, you know, like they, they don't have the publication record. Like sometimes you'll get this, like this, I, I think it, it's, it's an, it's an unfortunate thing that maintains the separation between science and people who would actually otherwise use it in our field, especially, which is applied for people, you know, exercise, science, nutrition, where because they don't have this skill set and because they're not getting the same level of general attention, and also not just that, I don't think it's just ego, but also they would do it a little bit differently. They would want more caveats. They don't, they, they think like short form social media, it's complete trash because you can't even communicate the depth of information needed on those platforms. So of course you're going to by default be getting it wrong. And it's not that they're incorrect. 
it's just that they don't understand the audience. And there's this, uh, I'm, I'm going to get the, the number wrong, but I'll, I'm going to get the general idea right. There was a paper published upon on how many people and who reads scientific publications. And I think the average number is five. And it's th- those five people are typically other people in science. And that's something we just, that's okay, maybe in theoretical physics, you know, but we can't have that in exercise science and nutrition science where the authors are literally writing, well, if we want to change obesity policy, or if we want to see a change in the, l- l- the rates of activity in the U.S., that needs to be read by more than five people if that's the goal outcome. So the kind of the, the whole older generation method of teaching scientists how to do things I think is part of the problem and, or at the very least, what I'll say is it generated the need for people like you and I to exist. And when I say quote unquote, people like you and I, that's a relatively broad spectrum. There are people who did a bachelor's degree and then are just kind of science interested and talk about this, who do a great job or do a terrible job. Um, but they're still trying to do the kind of the same thing. And like you said, there's also people with MDs, PhDs, who may be a little more interested in actually selling you something and they get some things right, but then they will also be charlatans. So I can think of one particular PhD in exercise science who, you know, it's, it's, I'll read the post and I'm just like, this is, not only is this wrong, it is blatantly wrong, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's just, it's, it's tough to combat the, the time it takes to disseminate misinformation, the time it takes to actually correct that, I think I saw a statistic that's like five to 10 times the amount of effort it takes. Yep. So when I think about like, um, I did a debunk of all Saladino appearing on the Joe Rogan podcast. That podcast was three hours long. Yeah, For me to, and I took every single claim, put the claim, and then put whether, you know, based on the research, it was correct or not. I think it took me just to listen to it about eight hours because I was having to stop, write down the claim. Then I had to go, you know, write it up, cite it. I mean, it was probably, I don't know, 20, 30 hours minimum, you know, and that's about a three hour podcast. So it's, and I don't think the average person has a real perspective on, I, you, you and I can just go out tomorrow and be like, Hey guys, dog shit, super anabolic. All right. And uh, we could find like some compounded dog shit that was done in the in vitro study that increased myotum during during I I promise you we can fight, you know, and we can actually create a compelling story as to why that's anabolic, right? Um, and there's a lot of people who do that kind of stuff. And it's 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 very hard to get around because then trying to explain why it's wrong is really difficult. And man, you brought up so many great points in the the last kind of monologue you were we were talking about, research and um the problem with old academia and kind of academic influencers, I guess. And I think, you know, I had a really, really, I mean honestly, the farther out I get, I had such a fantastic PhD advisor. Like just honestly I am so lucky I had Dr. Don Lehman uh, because, you know, he was aware that I was like posting on bodybuilding forums. Then when Twitter came up, he was aware I was on there. And I, I asked him one time, I was like, you know, do you like, like, does it bother you that I compete in bodybuilding? And does it bother you that I write articles about this stuff? And he said, no, nobody reads academic publications, like mm. take it straight to the people, you know, he's like, you know, be smart about how you do it. Like, don't make, you know, don't make really strong claims, but like, you know, take the information directly to the people. I think that's a great idea. And still to this day, he'll tell me, you know, I'm super proud of you for what you've done. You know, it's not his style. And I, like, I recognize that my style is very unique, very different than a lot of people. Although I will say the whole having a video pulled up, you debunking it in the background, there's quite a few people that do that now, which I actually love. I think it's great because for a long time, I kind of felt like I was on an island. And I'll tell people, you know, on the forums, I always debunk stuff. You know, that was a very, like, that was a very, you could probably remember me getting into it with many people. Um, I would like to think I've mellowed out a little bit in my age, just a little bit. Um, but I would say, you know, when I first started putting out content in terms of social media, 
And when I say content, like actually not just, oh, I saw something cool here, throw it up on Instagram or, or whatnot. Like actually thinking about what do I want to put forth as kind of marketing marketing material or you know getting people to understand it a different way. I, I very much just did. Like I just talked about stuff like the old bio lane video logs. That's just me talking about topics, you know? And then as I coached, and I'm sure you had this experience. I think so many people come to me and I'm like, oh my God, like these coaches are going to kill people, you know, yeah. which has actually happened now. Like there's people who die getting ready for bodybuilding shows or just, you know, even just want to lose weight just with really, really bad advice. And I also saw as social media grew, the stuff that went viral was again, very clickbaity, very attention grabby. And so I kind of had this, I had two kind of uh, epiphanies, right? First one was, okay, I don't want to be someone I'm not. I don't want to be a clickbaity guy. But if we have a spectrum of, you know, the headline of a, like the actual title of a scientific paper to a clickbaity headline, I'm going to take the topic of my video or my post as far to here without actually being incorrect or too unnuanced. I'm going to take it as far here as I can, right? And for different topics, it's going to be different. But I, I am going to try and grab those eyeballs because I look at it as if I'm trying to compete for eyeballs mm -hmm. because, and like, listen, I'm a business owner. I'm not going to lie. Of course, I want to make a boatload of money. I'm not going to like, you know, have any qualms about telling people that, but I want to do it in a way that is falls within my like what I believe is ethical for the way I do things in my own, like, I don't want to be somebody I'm not. And so there's going to be a certain stopping point where I'm, I'm just not going to take it any further in the clickbaity. But it's like, if we don't do a little bit of that stuff, we, there is no possible way that we are going to be able to compete with the people who are willing to do that. Right. And I think when I was younger, I had a little bit more of the highbrow academic sort of, I don't want to sink to that level. I don't want to, you know, at least publicly be debunking people. Although I'd argue with people in the forums, I kind of looked at that differently, just like exchange of information. But then again, I just saw like all these claims coming up. And then you realize too, that just me putting out content, like if I cover a topic one time, in three days, nobody has remembered that, right? Like I post about a lot of the same stuff over and over. But it's because the life cycle on social media is so short. People's yeah. memories are so short. So little of your audience actually sees it. And um, people... There's always new entrants as well. Yeah. You know, right. as they say, a sucker's born every minute. You and I were suckers at one point, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you're like, oh, I don't know. Uh, as, you know, at Castero, yes, let's do that Castero, you know? I didn't com combine carbs and fats for my, my first uh, few diets because insulin. Yep, exactly, exactly. Because nobody thinks about, well, there's this whole thing called 24 hours in a day and not just individual meals, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, like, listen, again, that was a, you know, that was a, when you read the mechanistic argument as to why not to combine carbs and fats, if you don't consider a full 24-hour day, it makes a lot of sense, right? But then if you actually look at the research, there's, there's nothing to suggest that. And when you understand about how this stuff works on a 24 hour basis, you understand why, oh, okay, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. Um, but yeah, so I, I started like doing these debunking videos, kind of just like, because I was just, I was just kind of sick of all the bad information out there. And it's so funny when I, I'll have people now, pretty much every video, so you're a hater or you, you know, why don't you just put out good information, just focus on you and not these other people? I'll say, uh, you probably haven't followed me very long. Because I, I don't, I, I may be overlooking somebody, but I would put the quantity and quality of information I put out over a 20 year period up against anybody in terms of like in the exercise and nutrition community. So yeah, I, I have done that. The problem is it, you still have these people who are going to make these really big claims. And honestly, it's kind of like either you play a little bit of the game or you're not even going to be in the game. Right? Yeah. 
And, um, you know, those videos have become very popular with me. Now, I have tried to, I think I was a little bit too overzealous and uh, probably included too, a little too many ad hominems at first. Uh, and I've tried to really, like, focus my attention on the arguments. But, I mean, like, listen, do I exaggerate, like, face palms and eye rolls and all? Of course I do. Like, of course I do. Because, like, I am trying to, if you're just conveying dry scientific information, like, it's hard to get people's attention. You know, but if you're being a little more animated, you're providing a little bit of entertainment, you know, then people might be more likely to watch. And that gets into your point. I think about like highbrow academics who I think there's two parts of that. One is ego. As you said, they look at somebody who like me, for example, maybe, um, and say, well, why is that guy getting so much attention? I'm the one publishing the research. Yep. And they totally valid. Listen, like in... Like I saw somebody arguing with Stu Phillips on a on a post of mine, and they said something like, "Who are you?" I'm like, "He's only the most cited researcher in the entire fitness space. That's who he is." You know, like you're literally arguing with like a rocket scientist about rocket science. Um, so like, and to be fair, like I don't want to include Stu and like the highbrow Stu actually like has yeah. me what I do. And he's very supportive of like the social media stuff. He's like, I'm glad you guys do it. So I don't have to do it, you know? That's right. Um, And quite frankly, like academics, they're so, I mean, I am beyond impressed with how much work Brad Schoenfeld puts into being on social media with how much research he publishes. Mm -hmm. It's, it's very, very impressive because most just don't have the bandwidth to do all things. It's, it's really difficult. And so yeah, I can tell you as someone who who does that, and and not at the same level as, as, as Brad, because because no one does, that you really have to partition your time, and um, and especially to do it at a high quality in 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 both. So it's it's I'm, I'm glad you're talking about the strategies and the approach and how you've modified things over time, because yeah, it is it is difficult, and I think finding that point along that spectrum of how many of the how many of the of, of the evil strategies of the enemy do we adopt in our own mission against them? I think that's how the way I originally viewed it, but now I just view it as listen. There's effective marketing, there's effective uh, communication, and there is the psychology of humans in mass, and you use all of it to the degree to which it is no longer subverting your mission. Um, or, or to your point, uh, doing something that you feel is, is unethical, which I think in most cases would subvert your mission, or that you are personally not comfortable with and comes across as disingenuine, which again, people will pick up on in most cases and it will kind of subvert the mission. And I, I think it's interesting that you and I have different points, um, not only on that spectrum, but I also think that we take slightly different approaches. Like, um, yeah, yeah, which, which, which makes sense for different people, but I... You, you mentioned earlier, you know, like the trauma response and using too many ad hominems. I, I, there's, I know there's been at least times in your life, and I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but um, feel free to, of course, adjust them, where you've almost, like, lived life like it's a war, you know? Like, oh, yeah. Like, you know, I've, I've, I, like, we've traveled together, we've spoken at conferences, and, you know, you're dealing with an injury or you're getting ready, and, you know, like, uh, if anyone who thinks Lane isn't the way he is online, you're, you're wrong. I've I've seen the man get up in the morning and put on motivational uh, like speeches to go take a shower, um, and you know, and then hype himself up like he's doing a deadlift to go speak at a conference. Um, and I don't do those things. People know I don't do those things, but that's okay because we're not the same. Um, so I know for you, what to me looks like an endless whack a mole swimming upstream challenge of dealing with all the people putting out misinformation is to some degree attractive, motivating, and it's like this endless supply of ability to get after it. And of course you've recalibrated to go, oh, you know, maybe maybe the ad hominem attacks or those are maybe fallacies themselves and that's kind of subverting. It's all a step away from that. Like you're, we're, we have to recalibrate because it's difficult to know where to land. But I know for me, the approach I've taken is, man, um, there are so many things that people need to not, need to know what not to do I'm going to spend my time telling them what to do. And I think I've also realized another thing, Elaine, I think this is interesting, is that 
I'm maybe even one step further removed from the general audience than you are as far as who do I target. Like, for example, with mass, I would say that the type of uh, target audience we have with Iron Culture, uh, my books even, definitely there's a lot of people who just buy them who are interested in training. But a lot of the times I'm reaching out to the trainers or the other, I'm, I'm going to say micro-influencers, but that's not always true. Like, for example, like Dave Tate is a subscriber to Mass, you know, which is one of the coolest things in the world. But yeah, it's like, whoa, right? You know, so what I've come to realize is that a lot of what I do is educating other people who might be going out there and having that type of influence. And because I, and it works with my personality because I can only do so much of what you do. And I went from, I think initially, and I'll be perfectly honest, being frustrated with the way that you would communicate probably when you were a little more like, let's go after him. Let's, 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 let's go to war and addressing more the person than the claim. But as I've seen the world change and just realize, my God, like these conspiracy theories can take hold at a level that is truly damaging society. I've realized that we need someone to play whack-a-mole because there's a lot of fucking moles out there, man. And it's kind of, it's kind of scary. And if someone is willing to, to, to wade into that and deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis and can garner a large following and get on to Joe Rogan and Huberman, um, then, then good. So it's, it's been a interesting learning experience for me to see where, you know, my beliefs and probably my biases towards my own perception of the world and personality have, you know, like they, they produce what I do. And I think I do what I do as well as I can, but I know that the reach is only going to go a specific direction in so far compared to what other people do. So I'm interested just to see, to hear from you, because I've, I've kind of put some words in your mouth and my perception on it. Do you ever feel like you're swimming upstream or do you feel like, um, like it's an endless process or that it's maybe, do you think your energy could be better spent elsewhere or is this just what fits your personality well? So I think the first thing that I, I will address is you know, that is why I, a lot of people would love to bag on social media. I think it's like any tool. It's how you use it, right? Um, there's a lot of great things about it, a lot of bad things about it. But one of the great things is that's cable TV, baby. You know, it's actually pay per view, right? Or it's actually yep. not even pay per view. It's you pick your own, right? If you don't like the way something, not everybody's going to like my delivery. They'll like yours or they might like, uh, you know, any, any other Jeff Mippert, any other number of, you know, evidence-based fitness people. Totally cool. Follow them. Like, you know, like that's, I totally get it. I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not going to be everybody's cup of tea. You know, I, I don't want to be, you know, uh, I'm sure you're the same way. Like if I tried to do your kind of content, I'd feel really uncomfortable. And if you try to do mine, you'd feel really uncomfortable. Right. I, I always say like, um, you know, I, I compare it to the way we lift, right? Like I'm getting hyped up. Like I'm going to sacrifice a goat, you know, and, and uh, you got guys like Mike Tushar, who looks like he just got up from a nap when he goes to, to you know, pull a heavy deadlift. If he tried to lift like me, he wouldn't perform as well. If I tried to lift like him, he wouldn't perform as well. And, you know, you got to know, like you said, you got to know yourself. You got to know what you're comfortable with. Um, you know, it's interesting you say swimming upstream because I, I feel like when I was most frustrated was when I felt like, when am I going to win? When am I going to get to the end point? And I think my mindset shift in the last year has actually shifted. I would say the last year, which is there is no end point. There, there is no winning this. There is how do I make a little bit more of a positive contribution towards, you know, turning the tide just a little bit, right? And there's been snake oil salesmen ever since people exchange things of value, right? So that's, that's never going to stop. Um, and, and my favorite is when people go, we need the government to regulate it. And I'm like, okay, but the government's made up of people and they aren't always the best at also determining who's an expert and who has, you know, who's making good claims. So, um, you know, I think having kind of self-policing of an industry is, is one of the best things that you can have. Um, and, you know, I, it's going to be a weird kind of uh, analogy, but I heard John Deloney, he's a friend of mine, he's a, he's a mental health podcast. And 
somebody called in and asked him, like, how do I know when I've become like mentally healthy? Like when I've, you know, arrived. And he goes, this is a journey, not a destination. Mm. You are always going to struggle with stuff. There is not a single human being out there who is not going to struggle with stuff. Now, I remember thinking about that as, as it relates to what we're talking about and thinking, there is no destination with this. You know, it's whackable. As soon as I, I also, you know, Gary Gekka pops up and they go pop him or the day going to pops up, they go pop him, right? And uh, they're going to keep popping, you know? But, you know, I remember actually the conference uh, where you're talking about where I literally said you can go to war, you know, when you're debating with somebody. And actually, I think this shows perfectly the the difference in approach, but why both can actually still be effective. Um, so when we're talking about how to actually convince somebody, if you were aggressive towards somebody, you're not going to convince them. Right? Like, very rarely you're going to convince them, no matter how much data you put towards them. But it's also very rare that you convince anybody, even if you're nice, even if you put data towards them, if it's against their bias, right? Mm-hmm. People don't realize internally, and we are all like this, our level of skepticism for things that don't fit our bias, way up here. Our level of skepticism for things, and I'm, this is me too. Our level of skepticism for things that fit our bias, way down here, right? I think most people aren't aware of that, you know? No. And so you actually alluded to this earlier, and I will tell people, again, I'm so lucky I had a good PhD advisor who quite frankly crushed many of my ideas in a kind way. Um, I just got okay with being wrong about stuff. And... I tell people being wrong is actually a beautiful thing because if you're right about everything, you can't improve. You're already doing everything to the maximum, right? So if you find out you're wrong, I mean, I like being right. I'm not going to lie. But if I'm wrong, cool, now let's recalibrate. And there's, we've got another another tool on the tool belt. And so when it comes to approaches, I think I don't, I, when I'm, kind of going back and forth with somebody, I, it's never about the person. I'm not trying to convince them, especially if it's somebody who has a monetary interest. You know, I'm not trying to convince them. Who I'm trying to convince, and this, this is the same thing with political debates, I'm trying to convince that little sliver of people in the middle mm. who aren't completely bought in either way, who are still open to hearing the evidence, right? Because if you're like hardcore, you know, low carb or your hardcore fasting or whatever your diet tribe is. I mean, I just, if if you haven't been convinced by the evidence I've provided so far, it's just not going to be convinced. Now I have had certain people who have said, I used to hate you. And then I just kept listening and listening and listening and saw the points you were making. And over time I changed my mind, which is awesome. I love that. That's very masochistic of them, but, but uh, good on them. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. A lot of, Lot, listen to a lot of words out of this mouth. Um, but yeah, it's just, you know, it's trying to teach people, we're kind of back to our original point, what to look for, right? The way somebody talks. And you kind of mentioned it uh, when it comes to academics. A lot of times when you're writing up a scientific paper, you're actually supposed to make like the devil's advocate argument. Like you're yep. supposed to make that argument, but then explain why you think your argument is better, right? Um and I am always trying to actively disprove what I believe to be true because I would rather disprove myself, come out and say, hey, guys, got this one wrong, than have somebody like, you know, like whack a mole me and like spike the football, you know? So it's, it's just one of those things where I think it, people will see the way I talk and how I debunk things. And they will see arrogance. But if you listen to my content and you listen to how many times I've said, hey, I got this wrong or I've changed my mind on this, the delivery may be a little bit arrogant, but the underlying ability to check my own biases, there's actually quite a bit of humility there. And I think that that's something that a lot of scientists get Hopefully, if you've done a PhD right, you get humbled at various times. I mean, I can remember my first scientific presentation I did experimental biology in 2008, I want to say. And I got, it was a 10-minute talk, and I got absolutely eviscerated 
by, I think it was Pitt Charge from, uh, from Canada. And, um, you know, at first I was like really upset about it, but that was actually the best thing that could have happened to me Uh because that happening, I realized, wow, there's a whole other layer to this that I, I, I thought I knew my stuff and I didn't. So now I've got to really understand this. So the next time I'm not like, you know, tucking my tail between my legs as I walk off stage. So, um, you know, I think a lot of it just boils down to like the ability to admit you were wrong, the ability to consider other factors. And I think the other thing I will say a lot is when people say, well, this was a bad study or this study sucks. And I'm like, hey, 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 there's very few bad studies. There's poor interpretations and there is way too broad of applications based on their actual, like the way it's designed. But data is just data. Yeah. And I think another problem is way too, like the easiest thing to critique is the funding source. And listen, I think that stuff is important to disclose. There's a reason it's disclosed on scientific papers. It, it is important. But in my experience, if there was actually some, if there was something nefarious going on, it is not as overt as a lot of people think it is. It's much more in when you go through the study design and the statistical analysis, you see, if you know what to look for, you go, oh, well, of course they found this, right? Like they set it up so they would find this, right? Yeah. So in this particular scenario, yeah, this makes sense. But it's not necessarily the funding source. I think actually two things much stronger than a funding source are the researcher's own personal bias and also them wanting to not get the null hypothesis because as a, sci- as a scientist, you know, the null hypothesis is way less publishable than, than actually getting a result. I think those two things are much more important than funding source when it, when it comes to like actually kind of having a, a I want to call it a bad study, but like sure. a study not done to the to the to the level of a study that someone is 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 willing to dismiss outright. You know, like the the, the typical way they go to the well for that is point to the funding source, scream about it. But that's honestly not not the typical issue. Um, I totally agree. I think that's an accurate assessment. I want to focus back on something you said about when you're addressing these false claims. Um, that you're trying to speak to a sliver of the population that is not you preaching to the choir, you know, people who are already like, yeah, go get them, Lane, or the people who are fully bought in and they're the followers of this person already. And you know that there's, at least at this stage, probably no convincing them, you know, while they're, uh, you know, religious adherence to this person. And I think that's where the value in, in having different personalities and different types of approaches are. Because... If we just look at um, what types of charlatan-esque science communicators, I'm not, I'm not science communicators, but um, like charlatans who have risen to epic heights in our fitness space, influencers, yes, like Liver King, the guy is, you know, he's got a buffalo hat on, he's, you know, talks in a deep voice, like clearly there is this desire to listen to uh, like strong personality, ma- hyper masculine men who have, you know, like are animated and they have like this t- type of kind of flavor. You know, you can see it in Joe Rogan. You can see it in like a lot of kind of some of the uh, like the demagogues who pop up. And I'll, I'll go ahead and say it. Some of them kind of skew generally like kind of right wing. But I, I don't think it I think it's more of a flavor that it really actually is like a political you know, identification, because I think it does cross cultures. And I think being able to appear like that or appeal to people like that or share some of those, I'm going to call them affectations, because I don't think they necessarily needs to be any deeper than that, but then provide them also with an appeal to rationalism and skeptical thought um, and logic I think is important because I think across all the different types of personalities and political leanings and regions and age groups and all that, there are those elements in the people who have them or can can be cultivated. So different approaches and different styles, I think, are actually quite important um, because 
you know, there are probably a lot of people who they just can't get over what you described as the perception of arrogance when you talk. And it's just, just not going to happen, right? But at the same time, how many times have we seen someone who was, you know, too willing to be, you know, conscientious of the other person and not cross certain lines and, and sound professional? And the perception in certain parts of the internet is, oh, they got steamrolled. Like I remember, or or that they're just, a, or or somehow it makes them sound like they're oh they're the arrogant one. You know, they, like they're uh, they're 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 the stuffy highbrow like elite you know like the academic person in the ivory tower i remember when there was a debate between uh yes so the some of the debates that have happened on joe rogan have have, have been so clear to anyone who knows their stuff watching dna versus Tobbs. a hundred percent yes steven dna versus gary Tobbs had the perception in the general joe rogan audience that uh, Tom just wiped the floor with this stuffy academic who was just a jerk, you know? And when I listened to it, I'm like, I, I knew that was going to be the perception, but I also knew like, man, this guy is like, he's just anecdote versus meta-analysis, what we're looking at here, right. you know? But um, yeah, that that's, it was ineffective. And I think knowing how to, knowing the optics on that is quite important, even if you aren't willing to play that game. Because then you can decide which arenas do I want to wade into and what's the most effective way that I personally can start, you know, dealing with this. Because like you said, it's like the tide. It's going to come, it's going to go. And even though I'm much more in the business of like, like the, my, my schema of how do I, how do I make a difference on a day-to-day -day basis? How do I do this? I don't try to address all of the, the claims that come up um, as they do because of all the things we talked about, and there's better people to do it like yourself. But what I do think about is, all right, what type of cognitive error are people making? What type of skill would they need to not make it in the future? And how can I communicate to them a principle-based thing that will help them not do this? That was like the entire conception of the muscle and strength pyramids. You know, I was having these consultations literally daily with people who knew all these things but they were just overwhelmed and couldn't prioritize it. So I'm like, all right, I need to teach people a hierarchy. Okay. But the thing that I've come to realize as well, Lane, is that not everyone is willing to sit down and have me teach them principle-based systems of learning. Because what I'm actually saying is, hey, let's get into epistemology. And I think most people are like, fuck, how much protein should I eat? Shut up, Eric. You know? So... I've, I've realized that I've already partitioned myself to a certain group of people who probably have at least been burned once or twice and are now willing to decide I don't want to get burned again, or they're just not progressing. It doesn't have to be a negative thing, like they're getting spit up and chewed out by charlatans, but that unfortunately off, often is the case. So I've come to realize that I am already only talking to people who want to give me more than the minute and a half real, you know? Um... And that's Richard bias. Exactly. So it's selection bias. It limits my audience. But I do hope that a lot of people who are going to be the next Lane Norton perhaps listen to my stuff, you know? So it's it's an interesting thing. And I've come to realize that it's not about, oh, am, am I nice and Lane's mean? Or is is Lane arrogant and I'm and I'm and I'm too meek? It's more of who are we engaging with along this chain of communication? Because both are important. I don't I don't know if you see it that way. Oh, I, I, I 100 percent see it that way. Absolutely, and I, again, I think it just boils down to like, what feels authentic to you as a, as an influencer communicator, you know? Like, and are like, okay, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw an analogy and I'll bring it back to social media communication. I forget who I was having this conversation with. We were talking about money and success and all this stuff, and I go, I I wouldn't want to make hundred million dollars. Like, what do you mean? I'm like, hey, listen, if a hundred million dollars fell on my lap cool, you know, but I don't want to live the life it would take to make a hundred million dollars, right? Like Elon Musk said this. He said, I don't think a lot of people would want to be me because you don't just get all that in isolation. It all comes with other stuff, right? So bringing it back to social media, it's like you can look at somebody who has 50 million followers. Hey, maybe I could get there, but I don't want to, I want to do what it, I want to do the stuff it takes to get there. Right. 
Like I, I look at people like you know myself, Jeff Lippard, Brett Contreras. I'm probably leaving out a few people who I think, for the most part, have really stuck by their guns, um, and have like created a very large following. But like, look at who's the who's the most. I mean, we're talking about like Brett has like uh, I think 1.2 million followers, something like that. Like amazing, you know, like really incredible for evidence based stuff. But like you look at some of the people out there who are spewing misinformation, and it's multi, it's magnitudes more than that. Right. Yep. But again, it's like, I don't want to do like, if you look at, if you go look at some of these reels that I debunk, if you look at the number of shares they get, I mean, if I get 10,000 shares on a reel, that's really good for me. Some of these reels are getting a hundred, 200,000 shares, right? If I wanted to get that type of engagement, I'm pretty sure I could, cause I know what the formula is. Like I'm yep. not, I'm not stupid. Right. Um, but I don't want to do that. And even in like your sphere of, okay, if you're being evidence-based, okay, maybe you could get up to the point where like you're having almost a million followers like I have, but it's going to feel really inauthentic to you of the stuff you're going to have to do to get there, right? So I think like being honest with yourself as a communicator and like just what you said, what is my personality? What feels genuine to me? Um, and, and staying in that range. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. You know, like I think way too many people get caught up in, in numbers and metrics and, and viewing that as a, a modicum of success. And, you know, you know, when it, again, when it comes to money, I kind of look at that and go, you know, if I made a crap load of money, changed a lot of people's lives, my kids hate me. I, I, that's a failure to me, you know, like I, I wouldn't want that. And so you're always, I, I think, just try to think about what, is genuine to me that that is doing it to the best of my ability. And it's so funny how my life has become set up, which basically, Eric, my day-to-day is mostly answering emails, getting on calls, like business calls with my partners and my employees, reading research, and doing social media. And that's pretty much it. And I, it didn't start with that was the idea, but I started looking at, okay, what, what levers do I pull and what makes the biggest difference? This is the lever that's making the biggest difference, right? And it's, it's not just for reach and all that kind of stuff. It's for income for my companies and whatnot. Um, but I will tell people, you know, when they ask about social media, I'm like, hey, it's, it's actually not that difficult. If you just, if you start doing, if you put out information, because social media actually gives you a ton of information about what performs well. Like if you just go to your Instagram insights and you pull up posts from the last two years, sort them by follows, it will become extremely apparent for most people what does well. Like for me, if you pull up that metric, it is 90% screenshots of my Twitter. Like that, for whatever reason, people love that shit. Uh, and then the rest are like mostly by what the fitness reels and a couple of education reels, right? Um, and so it's like, okay, do I want to do a bunch of, you know, topic carousels where I'm like doing swipe throughs and stuff? Maybe they do all right, but like, no, because I can convey that information in a way that they're, that obviously my audience space and the people who are inclined to follow me like. And I really like what you said about, um, you know, maybe maybe you're not going to be that guy, but you'll touch somebody who goes on and be that guy. It, it is that guy. And one of the things I said to Bill Campbell when we were creating Physique Coaching Academy, I said, I want to teach people how to think about this stuff, not just give them the information. I want to, like, we have an entire module on how to read research. And obviously, in a, in a, in a less than a year-long course, you can't go super in-depth, but you can give somebody a lot of tools in a module to just kind of get started, right? And teaching people how to think is so important because once you understand how to think, you can apply it to a lot of different things. In fact, one of the things I tell people, when I went back to grad school, I'd be like, dude, take more stats classes. Yeah. Because if you're a statistician, you can look at almost any set of data and understand what it's telling you. Like, I really wish I'd spent more time on that. Um, and so I'm now having to like relearn some of this stuff, you know, through the course of time. But um I just attached myself at the hip to Eric Trexler, so we're so I'm good. Yeah, yeah, I've uh, I've texted Eric uh, multiple times and felt she not that he's like been like 
talk down to me or whatever, but it'll explain. I'll feel very sheepish. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But again, it's like, all right, if I look at, I only have a certain time budget. Is it worth it for me to go back and learn stats or like learn advanced stats? Or is it worth it for me to talk to people who understand that stuff and get a general, like, cause you only have so much time. Yeah. So I think, you know, what I found has found very cool about social media is exactly what you said is touching somebody who goes off and does stuff because it, it now is so funny when people go, Hey, do you know, like, and they'll put out influencer. I'm like, yeah, I coach them. Like, like there are so many people I coach and I'm not taking credit for that, but I'd like to think that, you know, working with like you and Birdo and, and, and some of these other folks, uh, I, I coached Jeff Nippard, you know, like that, that did have a little bit of an effect because I know working with Joe Klinzetsky had an effect on me. Yeah. And so if we can kind of create, okay, it's not just one to one, but if I am, you know, speaking to, or I work with or whatever, Oh, 50 people who go off and are now affecting 50. I mean, this is a, this is how we turn the tide, right? right? This is how we, we actually make change because if it's just, if I, I look at it like B2B versus B2C, right? Like oh, I'm just B2C, it's a slow, it's a slow, it's a slow, like you said, it's a slow and upstream, but if you're going B2B and you're helping other people who are creating their own sort of following an empire who are doing this stuff, now we actually have a chance to, yeah. to turn this tide. And I think one of the coolest things has been seeing, you know, like, fu- I, like, um, I've become uh, pretty close friends with Peter Atia. And, um, you know, one day I was, I, I saw the social media, he was on Disney plus with Chris Hemsworth. I click, click on Chris Hemsworth profile and it says, follow back. I'm like, wait, oh, shit. the hell Thor follows me. Fuck. Yeah. You know, That's awesome. but it's, you know, it obviously like they're not somebody who's doing stuff like hardcore in the fitness space and content, but it's like, man, you know, when you can reach people like that, who maybe, you know, just if they, cause if they read something on social media that goes in line with some of the stuff we say, it'll have 10 times more of an effect than anything we could ever do, you know? Very true. And I've ha- I did have people, um, one other thing I want to touch on is people have said to me, Hey, why would you go on Andrew Huberman show? You know, you, you, you disagree with some of the stuff he says, um, you know, he has a habit of like, he kind of like leaps to conclusions and some of this stuff. And I'll say, first of all, if somebody is willing to have a genuinely intellectually honest conversation, I don't care what side of the aisle are, they're on, I'll listen. Like I've done a podcast with Thomas DeLauer now, who's somebody I used to aggressively debunk. Um, and I found Andrew to be extremely receptive to changing his mind. And I like when I look at like some of the stuff I disagree with him on, I'm like, oh, this is like when I was a biochemist and I didn't have a lot of experience, you know, working directly with people. Um, I would get, you know, really excited about certain biochemical pathways, but sometimes wouldn't think about, okay, how does this apply to the broader context? And I think what's great about what he does is like he has a huge platform and he does have actual legitimate experts on his show. Yeah. So you know, to be honest, Lane, I would have far more of a tough time these days if someone asked me, hey, like if Joe Rogan invited me on, I would be a very difficult decision on whether I would or not. Huberman is not a problem at all because I think the difference is, is that Huberman clearly is promoting science, um, is a scientist. And yeah, like he does have some expert creep and makes and jumps to conclusions a little too quick. But ultimately, he's nurturing an interest in science in the health space for the community and all the things you said he has experts on. Um, I think, and academics do this, and certainly when I was younger, I was guilty of this, of being like in the unicorn fallacy. If it's not exactly what I want, then we're not doing it, right? Sure. And I think we have to look at, is this a net positive or is this a net negative? And we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? Sure. And, uh, which, you know, speaking of Rogan, like if he came calling, I would do the podcast only from the perspective of, Hey, he's either going to get me or he's going to get somebody else. And I'd rather it be me and be able to, you know, disseminate the good information. And you know, the only thing I get wary about going on is debates, not because mm-hmm. I'm not confident, but because debates are very dicey for the reasons you just stated. 
Um, because if somebody talks over somebody else, if they get a mic drop thing, you know, um, there's no fact checking either. I can say there's a study by Smith and colleagues that, that found this. And if you've never heard of it, it's possible it exists and you've never heard of it. It's possible. I just made that shit up and there's no way to check. And then we're going to be on Rogan for three hours. At some point, he's going to be asking me whether I think, you know, a gorilla could beat up a rhinoceros and it's going to get lost, you know? So here we are. And I think, you know, the only times I'm willing to do debates now are if it's somebody like if it, if it was uh, a Dom DiGostino, like I did on Rogan. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'll, I'll do it all day, every day. Cause I know Dom's sure. intellectually honest. Trust he's going he's gonna to see both sides of it. You know, if you and I are doing a debate, which we, I think, you know, we even had debate. It was, I can't remember who's was on whose side, but it was like me, you, Mike, or Zertel, Middle Hinselman's. And no, the debate was in the margins, you know, yeah. But it's like we all understand that we're intellectually honest, and if somebody makes a good point, we're not just going to like brush it to the side, right? Yep. Um, but if it's not somebody like that, if I'm debating uh, a Saladino or a Gary Brecca or something like that, I want to see your references in advance, and I'm going to show you mine in advance. Because I did have a situation where I debated Saladino back before he had a big following in 2018 or 19 on uh, Mark Bell's podcast. And I thought I did pretty darn well. I'm citing meta-analyses. I'm, you know, he's just kind of defaulting to that's healthy user bias, healthy user bias. And I'm like, it's healthy user bias when it's an, when it's something that is infrequent or kind of hit and miss. Right. But we're like, we were talking about dietary fiber. I'm like, you literally can't find me a study where dietary fiber is not at least neutral, and yeah. the vast majority are overwhelmingly positive for human health, right? If it was healthy user bias, you would have, this stuff would kind of be all over the place, right? Which is what you see with stuff like um, unprocessed red meat and cancer. You see that with uh, artificial sweeteners. You know, there are some negative studies, but it's kind of all over the place, right? Yeah. Uh, but you don't see that with things like dietary fiber. And then he cited a... Uh, we hadn't shared citations and he cited a trial where they said, you know, they limited, they reduced fiber in people that were suffering from constipation and it actually improved their symptoms. I've never heard of this study, didn't know anything about it. So afterwards I go look it up, no control group, self-reported symptoms. I'm like, okay, (laughs) you know, like, all right, do I leave open the possibility that some people may have improvements in symptoms in the short term from reducing dietary fiber? Sure. But again, if you're looking at the overall context of the data, it's pretty consistently clear that fiber helps with that stuff. But I kind of arrogantly just thought, well, I've got the research on my side. I know what I'm talking about. He doesn't. Um, But one... I didn't know enough about his position. And so when I, when I found out that his position was actually that kind of plants are toxic and trying to kill yeah. in themselves, quite frankly, I spent about 20 minutes trying to gather myself to like just recover from being so shocked that that was actually his, you know, hypothesis that I probably came across as a little bit unsure yeah. and um, just kind of, kind of trying to play catch up, you know, because I think in a good debate, what you want to do with somebody is make them state their position, get them into a box where you can then say, if this is true, this cannot be true. Right. And then you show that and and basically you paint them into a corner where they don't really have any way to get out of it. And instead I ended up chasing, you know, the entire debate. And so you know, I think debates are something that are very dicey. And in fact, uh, one of the things I'm going to do in the future is if I do go on debates, I'm hiring a debate coach because mm-hmm. I don't want to find myself in that position again. Um, because even though I know I won the debate and people who are in evidence-based community, I think somebody, I think it might've been Stu Phillips or somebody came on there and was like, anybody who thinks Paul Saladino won this debate needs to have their head examined, you know? Mm-hmm. But, but unfortunately... That's the thing, though, because debates are not the best assessment of what's correct. They're the best assessment of who is able to sound correct to people who, like you said, are not necessarily great at discerning those differences. So, yeah, I mean, there's a whole discussion we could have on whether debates are even useful educational tools. 
and in what context they are. Because I think when you do have people playing the same rules and everyone does cite evidence and there's a Google Doc where everyone can see what is the pre-submitted evidence, then maybe, but now we're actually talking the type of debates that you have in formal academic settings, which is not the same thing as and a good, mod a a good moderator. Yeah. Evidence. Well said. But Lane, one thing I do want to do is be respectful of your time and make sure that we uh, we wrap, wrap up this awesome conversation. A huge thank you for coming on and discussing this with me because I think it'll be an eye-opening insight for people. One thing, the last thing that I want to give some shine to is the fact that I know what motivates you to actually be in this space and communicate this and kind of give this service to our community like me is your own personal connection to lifting and the iron, you know? Um, so when, when I first started following you, you were in the hunt for a, a natural bodybuilding pro card. You were first maybe getting into powerlifting a few years after me in 2010. And you went on to actually, you know, at the time set a squat world record, play silver in the open, but you're still in it, which I love. Um, you've won a master's world title now. Just let the people know, like, what is next for Lane the Athlete? Because I know this, this is in many ways, is what connects you to uh, this this community. Yeah, um, Nationals for Masters uh, in, uh, in in June. Um, and it's going to be a lot of fun because um, there's a couple of guys, including Mike uh, Garazzo, who beat me at North Americans mm -hmm. after I beat him at Nationals. Uh, I beat him at nationals, I think, by like two and a half kilos, and then he beat me by a half kilo at Na at North American. So that gets me really excited, you know. Right there. It, it, that that one came down to the, like no one, very few people actually think about lot number, mm -hmm. and that was one of the only particular circumstances I had ever been involved in where a lot number actually made a really big difference. But it was so cool, you know, like, um, it, it was funny though, cause I was like talking about changing my deadlift attempts and Susie Gary was handling Michael Garazzo and Ben goes, well, we're not going to outmaneuver Susie. <laughs> He's like, why don't we just put on what we're actually going to do? I'm like, all right, fine. Um, but yeah, like that kind of stuff gets my juices flowing because, um, uh, I just love to compete. It is. Yep. And I think after having gone through all the injuries I went through and all the pain we have and all that, I mean, it was like a seven year process where I was able to come back and like compete here and there, but it was really like. You were in a neck brace when you were in Australia in 2016. I remember. Yeah. And, um, and then also I had a hip, had a hip thing. Like, um, like it gave me a new appreciation. And when I went to worlds last year, um, that was actually right when uh, Holly and I separated. And so there was a lot of emotional stuff going on, um, a lot of you know stuff going on outside. But I remember uh, telling people there, I'm like, listen, I'm going to be the, the happiest guy on the platform when, when I get up there. Because the idea that I can get back to a world championship after everything that I've gone through, um, like if I win or I lose, I'm going to be happy. But, you know, I just, I love being able to compete. And I, I think people see me too and they see how like aggressive and fired up I am. And if you talk to any of my competitors, you know that like most of my competitors like me. And yeah. if you don't have a, like Alice McClain and I had so many battles uh, back in the day and even Bryce, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's that mutual respect. It's people pushing each other. I, I freaking love that. Um, and just to see like, what can I do? You know, it's, it's, the W's matter, but one of the reasons I skipped Worlds this year, even though I qualified and would have won, I mean, okay, I don't want to say I would have won, but my projected total was over 50 kilos in front of the, the next person. But I didn't go, one, because I would have missed some time with my kids. And I didn't. I already missed quite a bit this year. But two, um, to me, that's, that's not that fun if you're not getting pushed. And, you know... It's that also my coach, who's Zach Robinson, who is in Mike Zoros' huh? lab, has published some really great research recently. He said, hey, like, what, what's the goal? If you could hit, if you went and won another world championship, or if you hit an all-time PR, I said, I will take the all-time PR all day, every day. Because, I mean, a world championship of the IPF is no joke. It's absolutely, like, that isn't, you, you are legit and you do that. But to me, again, after all the injuries and everything, the idea that I might be able to hit one more PR, that is way more exciting to me. So, 
No, I, I think that speaks to the spirit of why we lift the weights because it's to push yourself to the nth degree and also why the competitors enjoy your energy. And I know that when you're psyching yourself up, it's to empty your tank for you to be your best. And yeah, if the chips fall and you end up winning, that's awesome. But um, I'll just say for the whole cult that uh, seeing you get back on that world stage, seeing you win the Masters world title um, as someone who is inspired by you as, as an athlete, uh, it's that kind of, you know, original like lane mentality of outwork that is so central to what it is to be an iron enthusiast that I think everyone, um, whether they express it the same way or not, like you said, it looks like Mike T is, is getting up for a nap when he pulls 800 pounds. Um, they appreciate that because it's something that is shared. And uh, the fact that that has motivated you to do all the things that you have done, I relate to that you know, having just finished a contest season um, and, you know, being still at this in our 40s, I think is, it's, uh, it is really at the central core of, of what we do here. So I want to wish you the best um, moving forward. And I want to thank you for what you do and what you continue to do. And just know that I'll be rooting for you when you take the platform. Um, yeah. So with that, I, I'm sure that this is a question that most people will already know the answer to, but where can people find you if they want to see you ranting about all the charlatans in the industry lane? Thanks, Eric. And, and the feeling is mutual. I, I, you know, I, I am such a, I am so happy to see how many people are in evidence-based fitness now and how many people are doing the kind of Renaissance man thing, which is doing a PhD or doing a master's degree, but also competing and working with people and putting out content. I think that's like, that is such a difficult path to walk in so many ways. And I love that there's so many people who do it now. I think mm -hmm. it's absolutely phenomenal. Um, and you have your own like individual tree now of people who have worked under you or with you who are now going out and doing their own thing. And I'm sure as you found, it's very, very rewarding. 100%. Um, so if people find me, uh, biolane.com and at biolane on pretty much any social media. Um, I would say low key that YouTube is actually my better social media compared to Instagram and, uh, and Twitter. But, uh, most people have a short attention span. So Instagram is my strongest following, but, uh, you know, don't sleep on my YouTube because I think we put out a lot of really good content and, uh, hopefully also have a podcast coming out this year as well. Amazing. Well, folks, you heard it here. Um, our, our biggest competing podcast, we're going to cut that out, Brandon, just uh, leave that last little bit out. No, no, no. But seriously, make sure you give Lane a follow on all of his platforms, a ton of good information, especially if you're getting caught within the whirlwind of the, some of the information that's coming out and you're not sure if it's accurate. Um, he does a great job of safeguarding against the tide of nonsense and folks, this has been another episode of Iron Culture, one of the few where it's just yours truly, but this time with Dr. Lane Norton. Um, and you know what? If you like this podcast, you can do a few things for us. You can click like. You can also click subscribe if you want to keep hearing more of these come out. And if you really want to do us a solid and you want to give us a rating and review, well, if you're unsure of how to do that, don't worry. There's a lot of other people who have done it and typically not try to influence you, but definitely do this they leave five-star ratings. So if you need to understand what to do, that's what you need to do. And uh, for those of you who are regular listeners, don't worry, we'll be here every single insert date here, and we'll catch you in the next episode.